Donc, euh, alors, euh, Dutter Hall euh, il, euh, est originaire de l'Utah. Euh, il, il a fait son PhD euh, à l'Utah sur le gamma ray, euh, en gamma ray astronomy, donc euh, astronomie des, des rayons gamma. Euh, il a fait ensuite un postdoc au Fermilab de 2007 à 2012. Ensuite, il a été à PNNL. Euh, euh, sur, euh, où il a travaillé pendant cinq ans sur euh, le, le, la sécurité nucléaire et euh, aussi comme programme manager, euh, ce qui l'a éventuellement euh, mené à être directeur de Snow Lab, directeur de la recherche à Snow Lab depuis 2017. Depuis cette année. Et euh, donc, il se trouve à être impliqué dans la, le projet qui, dont il va sûrement nous parler, Super CDLS, qui est un secteur en germanium à très basse température dans lequel il y a des phénomène commun avec euh, ce qui pourrait se passer dans les, euh, les ordinateurs quantiques. Et donc, c'est le lien entre les deux. Donc, vous avez... Merci. Thanks, uh, Merci. Merci and uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for uh, inviting me and for coming to the seminar. I'd like to speak about uh, a convergence of two research fields, uh, light dark matter searches and quantum computing. So that's my goal in this talk. So first, because I am the director of research at Snow Lab, I am uh, obligated by law to give you an introduction to Snow Lab and tell you about our strategic plan. Then I will talk about some intersections with quantum science and technology, a little bit about light dark matter searches and then future directions. I've switched the order between light dark matter searches and quantum technologies. So if you get lost, let me know because this is a new order for me presenting these materials. And I want you to come along. So first, Snow Lab's located on the traditional territory of the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850, which is shared by the indigenous people of the surrounding Atikamekshang Anishinaabek First Nation as part of the larger Anishinaabek Nation. And we acknowledge those who came before us and those who are the caretakers of the land and waters. And we think this is, uh, we take this particularly seriously in our context because we are, as you will see, we are at a mining site. So this is at some of the traditional intersection of colonization and some of the indigenous peoples um, that have gone on in the past. So Snow Lab uh, hosts rare events, searches, and measurements. It's located two kilometers underground in the active Valet Creighton Nickel Mine, which is in Sudbury, Ontario, which is two short plane flights away. Uh, it's operated jointly by the University of Alberta, Carleton University, Laurentian University, Université de Montréal, and Queen's University. So you are part owners of Snow Lab. <laughs> Snow Lab operations are funded by the province of Ontario and the Canada Foundation for Innovation. So our new strategic plan, you can download the whole thing on our website, but I will just tell you the three pillars of the strategic plan. The first one is to drive breakthrough discoveries in the frontiers of underground science. And I will tell you a few of those frontiers as we've found them to be right now. Uh, we plan to continuously improve our research infrastructure. It is state of the art. We are the leading underground laboratory in the world, but we have a lot of competition. And so we want to maintain that leadership position for Canada and for the researchers in Canada. And we want to foster and develop diverse talent in an inclusive environment. This is one area where Canada leads. You've seen some of the politics in the US. I don't want to be political, but I think in the research environment, having a diversity of people leads to a diversity of thoughts, which will lead to better outcomes. And so this is really a strength in Canada and one that we want to develop at Snow Lab. So the scientific strategy, what is the science we do at Snow Lab? So as I said, it's, it's mainly focused on rare event searches. So our, our primary uh, users right now, most of the infrastructure is around uh, increasing our understanding of the particles and forces that have shaped the universe. Primarily, what is the nature of dark matter and what is the nature of the neutrino? So those are the two things where most of the projects are studying right now in terms of scientific objectives. Snow Lab collaborates with other scientific research requiring deep underground facilities. As the director of research, I can sell your project to Snow Lab much better if it requires being underground. Uh, so the, for some of those, we have neutrino observatories, but we also have projects on the effects of radiation on biological systems. Um, this is one where Bruce Power is, is happy to fund the research at Snow Lab because we're doing research on why radiation is good for you. 
um, environmental monitoring. So this is where we have nuclear nonproliferation aquifers. Um, because we are deep underground, we can get better sensitivity to certain isotopes in terms of gamma ray spectroscopy or other radiation counting techniques for studying materials. And then Snow Lab is interested in pursuing new collaborations and opportunities in emerging areas of science. And this is the subject of this talk, the effect of radiation on quantum technologies, which I think Luke already uh, pointed to in terms of uh, local temperature changes, but we'll see that the effects on quantum technologies are actually pervasive throughout the substrate. Underground science is fairly new as a technique, although you can find papers as far back as the early 1900s where people were trying to go under a bridge to see if the cosmic rays were really cosmic in origin or not. Uh, it, it really started to pick up in the late 80s and 90s, and you can see that in the scientific literature um, where we're now up to about a thousand papers a year that either are directly from underground science or theorists uh, uh, or experimentalists uh, discussing new projects that could be underground or the implications of data that have come from underground. This is a, a map of Snow Lab. Um, so I, I won't give you the full talk, but we operate most of this area, this area that I'm circling here as a clean room. Um, so you go two kilometers underground in the mine, you walk for a kilometer and a half uh, through the mine this direction until you get to this door here. Um, then we have two locker rooms. Uh, the genders separate, we take a shower, we get dressed in clean room gear, and then we can start our work in the clean laboratory underground. It takes about 45 minutes to get to work. We have many facilities uh, to help researchers. We have a machine shop, we have a wet chemistry laboratory, um, we have low background counting facilities, so you can see the radioactivity coming from your materials, and then we have a number of, of chemistry plants as well. We have large cavities. So this is the largest cavity here. This is the snow cavern. It's about 20 meters across and about 30 meters high. And these are similar large cavities here. And we have experiments, as you can see from all these arrows, filling up the laboratory. So we're actually quite full, but we're trying to maintain the momentum by turning over projects as quickly as we can to make sure that we're producing science and new science. So the rare event searches we do, um, are really focused on understanding and removing backgrounds because we don't, in dark matter, for example, we don't know what our signal is. So all we can do is fight the backgrounds to get better and better sensitivity to the signals. So what we do is we count. As particle physicists, all we do is count. Uh, we try to understand, and then we try to remove those backgrounds. And over the past two decades, we really honed these skills in the atomic to nuclear energy ranges from let's say a KeV up to a few mega electron volts. And here's another picture to show of one coupling. This is the coupling. This is the reason we go underground. So I've been playing around with AI, you've seen in some of my images. This is a, a picture of a supernova, uh, accelerating cosmic rays that bend in our magnetic field of our galaxy and then hit the atmosphere. When they hit the atmosphere, they can create as many particles. They can create particles up to the energy that they have with masses up to the energy that those cosmic rays have, or half of that energy or so. Um, and many of these will create muons. So there's a shower of muons coming down from our atmosphere all the time, going through our bodies, about one per second through my hand right now. And we go two kilometers underground to attenuate these muons so that we can count rarer events. So this one per second per 10 square centimeters um, gets much lower underground. So as we go underground where we are at Snow Lab, we have a reduction of about 100 million, maybe 50 million in the terms of the muon rate. So it goes from one per second through your hand to one per square meter for three days. And so we have the lowest muon rate. There's actually a laboratory in China, the Jinping Underground Laboratory, um, which has a very similar depth. But they did a, this is their measurement of the muon rate. And they found they were, although they're deeper in terms of how much rock they have over the head, their muon rate is slightly higher, but they're about the same. Okay, so I've discussed this. What we do is first we discover a detector and then we try to count whatever that detector is counting. This is our particle physics view of the world in rare event searches. Next, we try to understand those events that we're counting. Where did these come from? 
and then we try to remove them so we can get down to the signals. And this is the signal we're looking for in dark matter searches. So typically we focused on about a hundred GeV particle because this was the weak miracle. We found if we had a particle of this mass interacting with a weak scale cross section, we would get the right relic abundance of the dark matter in the universe. So this is the WIMP miracle. Um, if you have a particle, say some dark matter particle scattering off of a nucleus in your detector, with the speed of the Earth going through the galaxy, you have some interaction, and then you will kick these particles. Typically, I think of elastic scattering, so just billiard ball scattering. Um, and if you have 100 GeV particles scattering off of your typical nucleus, you get 1 to 100 keV of nuclear recoil from that scattering. And so this is what people had been looking for for the past two decades. And as we lower the backgrounds, we get sensitive to smaller and smaller cross sections. So that's the game we played for the past two decades. Yes, Francois. 100 GeV is about the mass of the proton? Or... 1 GeV is the mass of the proton. And that's a very important thing to point out. We will get back to the mass of the proton later. So here's an example of us counting, understanding, and removing. I like this. So most of our dark matter projects have targeted a background rate of one per year per experiment over the past two decades. So each experiment, we try to get bigger, but we try to constrain the backgrounds to one per year. Get bigger, constrain the backgrounds to one per year. That has been the game we played for the past two decades. Um, and it's been very successful. This is a good example of a project from 1987. This was a double beta decay project, so slightly different science, but they had a typical cryostat. Um, they built a cleaner cryostat. This is the rate of gamma rays as a function of energy. And you can see this is a log plot. So by rebuilding the cryostat, they were able to reduce the radioactivity hitting this chunk of germanium by two orders of magnitude. Uh, by going underground, they got another order of magnitude. And by changing the solder that they use, they were able to get another order of magnitude. So it gets down to the very materials that make up your detector. But we need all of these other things. Everything around the detector needs to be radio clean. Um, you have to be underground. And then you have to build your detector out of very pure materials. And this is uh, supposed, this very confusing plot is supposed to show you the success of this field over the past two decades. So this is that cross section I was telling you about. And this is the mass of the dark matter on this uh, axis. And we have not found dark matter yet or not claimed to except for these dots. Uh, so you would see a line like this. And that line means that we've excluded all the cross sections above these masses, above this line the cross sections and masses above this line. And so you can see these lines have gone down by many orders of magnitude over the past few decades. It's been about 10 orders of magnitude over the past two decades. Um, the underground infrastructure is required to make this happen. Um, backgrounds were radioactive decay. In our materials, sorry, much of the background is from dirt. So we've spent a lot of our time getting dirt out of materials. Okay, so what does this have to do with quantum technologies? We have a clock there. I've got one on this computer. Thank you. So this is the outline of just this piece of my talk. In case we get lost or I get lost, I'm just trying to say quantum computers are based on qubits. Qubits are made from low energy systems, typically. Environmental backgrounds are a source of decoherence in qubits. There's no radiation hard design rules for quantum technologies. And that's, a, many of you may know, there are radiation design rules for semiconductors. They've spent a lot of time of research in semiconductors to understand how to get rid of this environmental coupling to the cosmic radiation and the radiation around. This is why they build your semiconductors in a clean room, to keep the dirt off of it so it's not radioactive. An underground scientist can help address this challenge. So this one, you all probably know better than me, so correct me if I get this wrong. So this is a paper trying to study the energy spectrum of quasi-particles in a piece of superconductor. Now, why are people doing this? This is because quantum device developers, actually superconductor device developers, have spent decades struggling with environmental backgrounds. There is a population of quasi-particles out of equilibrium 
in every superconductor that anyone's ever measured, and we don't know why. And this particular paper is very nice because it has a lot of references to this quasi-particle poisoning problem, as they call it. Um, and it also claims to have measured that these quasi-particles are hot compared to the thermal equilibrium that you would expect in the aluminum. Um, I like to point out this lower plot here. Um, this is the rate of switching from uh, of the, the charge states of this trans one qubit, which you understand those words better than me. Um, they do not expect the qubit to be excited by quasi-particles if they don't have the energy to excite the qubit. So they expect the transition of the, the quasi-particles exciting the qubit from the ground state to the first excited state to be zero at low temperatures because there's not enough energy in the quasi-particles to promote those qubits. Instead, they see roughly the same amount of switching between zero to one and one to zero. And so the conclusion is that quasi-particle induced loss is responsible for a significant fraction of dissipation in state-of-the-art superconducting qubits. And they also confirm that hot quasi-particles with a highly excited energy distribution are responsible for the residual excited state population at low temperature in our samples. To a particle physicist, this is an extremely exciting conclusion. We have energy going into the system and we don't know where it's coming from. So this problem has been in the literature at least to 2002 and, and probably before. Ionizing radiation is a piece of this puzzle, but I don't think it's all of it. And I think that, you know, there is potential, not guaranteed, but will solving this puzzle yield a new component of nature? And this is just due to uh, past experiences. So for example, air. Is this uh, aluminum? This is aluminum. Although... Yeah. About the air Sorry, in the air. So one of the questions that led to nuclear and particle physics was why does why is air ionized? Why does air carry a current? Many of the early detectors, we would just measure the ionization in a, a cell of air. We would shoot radiation at it. It would get more ionized. So eventually the answer to why is the air ionized at room temperature is nuclear and particle physics. So radioactivity is a source of decoherence. This is an older slide that Laura Cardani, a, a professor at the University of Rome, uh, gave at Snow Lab. So radioactivity will soon be the limit of coherence for qubits. So you can see that paper for that claim. Uh, radioactivity limits quantum error correction. So you can see this paper, but I will also say a few more words about this. And suppressing radioactivity improves the performance of superconducting circuits. Now, in super CDMS, we built semiconductor detectors, as Francois mentioned. Typically, we build them from germanium or silicon, so we, we are happy to do either of those two materials. Um, so what happens is a particle comes in, uh, interacts here. It'll deposit a lot of energy. It can deposit 100 keV, let's say, of energy, which is very large compared to a qubit. Um, in super CDMS, we watch these phonons propagate around the crystal that are created by this. Um, there are actually phonons created from the interaction, and there are also phonons created from drifting the charges in the crystal. So you do work on those charges, that shows up at, as phonons. Um, the particle interaction deposited energy, that shows up as phonons. There's lots of phonons in every interaction. So we have transition edge sensors. We use tungsten because it has a lower TC. It's black magic to get the right TC out of tungsten, apparently, but that's what we use. We use aluminum collectors though. So these phonons will come in, they'll strike the aluminum. They break these quasi particle, these break these Cooper pairs, sorry, into quasi particles. The quasi particles diffuse down into the lower energy trap of the, the tungsten superconductor. And this is a very thin piece of tungsten. And so it can be driven up its transition with a very small amount of energy. Now we can have and I have personally observed, and I can make this happen with even lower energies, a single ionizing radiation event, so one event, can cause errors in every qubit on the substrate. So I've seen it drive every tungsten transition edge sensor to the normal state on the surface of a 100 millimeter squared substrate. So the energy can, can propagate 100 millimeters across a piece, a crystal, 
and affect the superconductor on the other side, driving it normal in this case. Now, if this happens to your qubits, if every qubit is driven to the normal state, then you have lost all the information in your qubits, and you cannot error correct that. And here's an example. So this is uh, a search for simultaneous errors with what was the latest Google quantum processor back in 22. Uh, there were clear evidence of particle interactions. This is the paper where they claim that. They watched the evolution of errors so they could see this hot spike of energy and they could see it propagate across the crystal and they could see the qubit errors by watching the qubit errors propagate across the crystal. They used 23 qubits for this. So when a particle comes in and interacts, all of the qubits go into an error state. This is all of the qubits. And then 100 milliseconds later, you're back down to where you expected, and your qubits are performing the way they were before. So this is a hard reset from some supernova in space that decided to reset your entire quantum processor. Yes? How frequent are these spikes? How frequent are these spikes? Yes, because that is important. Because this, if, if you cannot mitigate this, this is a fundamental limit to how much time you can calculate in a quantum processor. This is roughly the mean time is one every 10 seconds for this processor. Here's another example, which I quite like because this is almost at the point of turning this into a detector. So this is just a paper on quality superconductors. This is somebody trying to study a small island of superconductor to see the quality of this superconductor in terms of quasi-particle bursts. So they took about 10 femtograms of aluminum, uh, connected it to some normal metal, and they could watch the jumps of charge as quasi-particles tunneled off of the superconducting island. From that, you could reconstruct the number of quasi-particles created in the interaction, because it's just the number of jumps as you clear them all out. And you could do this for each burst of quasi-particles. So here is a longer time trace where you can see a number of bursts. They ran for about 4.6 hours, and they came up with this beautiful spectrum. To me, this is a, a radiation detector um, where we're measuring the counts as a function of energy, but here they presented it in terms of broken Cooper pairs per burst. And this is amazing because there are no radiation detectors with this low of a band gap. And the count rates are very high. So you can see in 4.6 hours at one quasi-particle pair in a burst, uh, there was 10 to the four counts, so 10,000. So there's lots of these going. This rate is very high. On the particle physics side, people say, well, don't you need a really big detector uh, for dark matter? And I would say, all we need is a detector that can count the rates that we're seeing. And this detector of 10 femtograms is counting the rate quite well. So th this is another um, plot where it shows the rate of those quasi-particle bursts. Sorry, you can't see the, this is the rate of quasi-particle bursts. Um, this is sort of 10 hertz right here, one hertz down here. And you can see that the rate drops over a period of time. And this is 10 days, this is 100 days. So this is sort of like a month-long half-life where you see these quasi-particle bursts decaying over time. And this is similar, and I will show you some plots in the next section, to what people are seeing in light dark matter searches. So I would claim that already, in terms of backgrounds, we're struggling with the same thing in dark matter searches as we are in these uh, superconductor research. So now let me explain to you the light dark matter searches back in my wheelhouse. Um, the idea here is the particle physics community hopes to tackle a broad dark matter mass range. So that 100 GeV WIMP, we're sort of throwing that out and we're expanding the mass range we're looking for and the interactions we're looking for. 
So the lower masses below that GeV of the proton mass requires extremely low thresholds because the energy that we get from billiard ball scattering starts to drop dramatically. Superconducting detectors have a promise of a dramatically lower threshold. And we're seeing new environmental couplings at these energies. So this is another plot of cross-section versus mass. The ranges have expanded so broadly that people won't really put numbers on interaction strength, for example. And you can see there are many, many orders of magnitude from a ZeV up to 10 times the mass of the sun. <laughs> um, but, but the idea is over the next century, we're really trying to target some of the lower masses and we're dipping below the proton mass, which is actually a fairly big surprise to me because you can't read this at all, but back in 2008, I had proposed a low energy search in super CDMS to learn, search for low mass dark matter. And, and the big barrier in my mind to actually doing this work was nobody cared about low mass dark matter, but now there is an entire field working on this problem. So here is where I said, we could take the CDMS detectors and ramp up the electric field, just turn it up. Um, and all the phonons from doing work on the charges that are created in an interaction will increase linearly with respect to the voltage. It's just the work you do on those charges. And so you can get a, a noise-free gain mechanism in these low temperature detectors by turning up the voltage. And so we did that. Um, of course, that ends once you get to the quantization of charge, right? Um, and that's important because as we mentioned earlier, if we have particles lighter than the proton mass, we start to get nuclear recoils that are less than an electron volt. If we have a 100 mega electron volt particle now, then we get energies that are less than an electron volt. And why is that important? because we don't have detectors that can see those energies really. A detector is really only thing, is something that can record um, some sort of change from a particle interaction. The details of the coupling are important for designing the detector, but they're not important for understanding the environment. So we already looked at this. So this EV energy, this is about, sorry, we haven't looked at this yet. Um, this is just a plot of energy as a and density of states here. So for example, here I'm showing that we can have atoms at low temperature, low energy, um, and at higher energies, we can have free electrons and ions. And the band gap in most materials is about an electron volt or higher. And this is about 10,000 degrees. And this is why we don't expect air to be ionized at room temperature. Um, Unfortunately, this also sets the threshold of a detector because you have to have at least one thing to say you have more than zero. And so we've achieved that in super CDMS. Uh, this is a plot of rate versus energy in phonons. And as we turn up the voltage, we start to see the quantization of charge. So we can see that sometimes uh, one electron is made, sometimes two, sometimes zero, sometimes three. So we can count the number of electrons in each individual particle interaction. We can count all of the single electrons in the leakage current across our 100 millimeter squared substrates. Um, and then we want to reduce that. So we have achieved this lowest threshold. And so that's the end of the story for low mass WIMPs for ionization detectors. So that's why superconductors are such a compelling detector system because of the smaller fundamental quanta. So typically in a superconductor, the gap that we think about is going from Cooper pairs to quasi particles. And this is about a milli electron volt. And so if we just take that, that's about a thousand times lower than your typical ionization energies. So we can get a thousand times lower threshold on this detector. And that's ideal for light dark matter searches. And it's also below the, the neutrino mass scale, which is fun to think about. I don't think there's any physics that anybody's come up with yet, but I don't think anybody's ever had a detector this low. So here I show an example of black body radiation. 
just to make my point about air, because I'm so fascinated with air, um, this is energy or photon frequency. Um, and this is photon flux, photons per second per steradian per centimeter squared per hertz. Um, this black line is one electron volt. So this is our typical ionizing radiation view of the universe wall. This is where the universe becomes particle physics above this energy in our traditional view in physics. And it's wave light down here. Um, this is sort of the transition region. And we're looking for detectors that can move down to this milli EV threshold. As I said, it's below, these are the neutrino masses. It's below the neutrino masses now, or at least the mass, the delta in the masses. Um, and you can see, this is what room temperature black body spectrum looks like. You can see this famous exponential cutoff below this electron volt, but it's well above this one milli EV. So we have to go to much, much lower temperatures to get these systems to have no background just from black body radiation. And these are enormous rates. So this is like 10 photons per second. This is 10 to the five photons per second per centimeter squared. So these are very high rates for us. And we have to kill this, even a leakage of some of these higher temperatures into your low temperature regime can cause significant backgrounds. So in addition to the ionizing radiation that we've traditionally thought of as our background, we now have non-ionizing radiation, stray fields, uh, vibrations, material stress, amorphous materials moving around, um, I like to describe for the particle physics theorists, if they can create a cloud of very cold neutrinos and put this det detector inside, we could just read off the wavelength of the annihilation photons and measure the neutrino mass. Um, nobody's figured out how to make a cold, dense cloud of neutrinos yet. And uh, dark matter could be a background in this regime. Now, people have been pushing the thresholds to lower and lower energies. But most low temperature results show the low energy backgrounds decaying over very long time scales. So this is seen in CCDs at very low electron hole pair counts, like one or two electron hole pairs in CCDs. Um, it's seen in uh, non-ionizing detectors as well, detectors based on just measuring phonons. So these three plots are from three different experiments, all showing backgrounds that seem to decay um, on this tens of day time scale. And it's very, to me, this is very similar to what they're seeing in superconducting electronics, seeing a decay of tens of days, month half-life in whatever's going on. I don't know. I'm hoping you could tell me. And then a few future directions. Okay. So quantum systems are sensitive to radiation from the environment. Hopefully I've convinced you of that, maybe. Uh, particle physicists researchers are gaining an understanding of modern quantum systems by collaborating on background reduction. And I think new detector systems are going to come from these collaborations, not only lower backgrounds, but new ways of building detectors. Here I list just a few concepts that are coming from these. It's actually fairly exciting to see the variety for somebody who's worked in the nuclear energy ranges where the detectors are old and not changing, this is very exciting to see. Um, so the milli EV energy detection, it's a theoretical and experimental challenge and people are tackling this head on. Um, the new quantum technologies are enabling new detection concepts in AMO. So this is uh, optically levitated sensors, superconducting nanowires, um, just a, a discussion of various condensed matter systems, um, including optical phonons and polar materials. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. People are really exploring this quite extensively. And here's a great example. So if particle interactions cause qubit errors, then qubit errors measure particle interactions, as I've been trying to convince you. And these old quasi-particle measurements for quantum computing can have sensitivity to light dark matter already. So this, this paper um, from 2021, which I already explained to you, um, this is a measurement of quasi-particle density. And they had basically the lowest quasi-particle density in a superconductor. So they took this as the baseline, the lowest amount of quasi-particle one could get. And if you look at the loading on this detector from dark matter, 
um, and say that all those quasi particles were created by dark matter interactions in the superconductor, then that would have been uh, something below this line. Again, this is cross section versus mass. So um, we can rule out anything above this line just based on the quasi particle density from this paper, uh, which is quite exciting. And this is actually more sensitive than all the dark matter detectors so far at the low masses. You can see down here at the low masses, there's an extreme sensitivity. Up here, the traditional detectors do quite well. Um, and this is 10 GeV and 1 GeV. This is that proton mass where they just start to lose rapidly. Um, here you can see that there are various constraints from astrophysical uh, observations. And these are dark matter detectors, but you can see that the quasi-particle work is pointing out that in the very near future, there are no constraints on dark matter in this region right here. So dark matter could be the primary driver of quasi-particle density in superconductors very shortly. We have no measurements that would say there isn't a dark matter density out there that's going to cause just a level of quasi-particles very soon. What are we doing about it? So Snow Lab host the lowest background millikelvin test facility on the planet. So we have a 10,000 reduction of rate from the surface. We have a 100 million reduction in muon rate, and we have radiation sources so we can bring them, thank you, to, this, uh, to these experiments. There are many details which I can go through. Uh, we have a onion, layer of lead, as I said, to get rid of radiation from the rocks around us. And then we have um, we have to take care of the materials inside, but we have lead above the payload inside the dilution refrigerator, and then we have lead surrounding the payload. Um, we are starting a new, this is our first real qubit project. So this is characterizations of qubits in a deep underground environment. This was funded by the U.S. Army Research Office. Uh, Professor Chris Wilson at the Institute for Quantum Computing is the leader of the project. And Chalmers University in Sweden will produce uh, cutting-edge superconducting qubit arrays. They're already in the middle of doing that. They're going to be tested in Sweden, tested in Waterloo, and then we're going to characterize them in Snow Lab. So in conclusion, I wanted to save a couple of minutes for if there are any questions. Um, light, dark matter, and quantum computing researchers are in a correlated superposition of research outcomes. So particle physicists will be early adopters of quantum technology. And after we perform joint research, we will be in one of two states. Either dark matter will have been detected, and it's a fundamental limit to quantum device performance, or we will have improved the performance of quantum devices but we will not have discovered the nature of dark matter yet. Thank you.